Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Addiction. I am your host, Al Richards, and we are here with our special guest today, Ryan Evans. Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Hey, we are here to talk about a topic, and, and I'm going to make sure I get it right. Prison, addiction, and redemption, which I am really stoked to hear what we have to say today and what Ryan has to say. also want to say... Thank you to my wife, Janan. She is our guest co-host. She was over there like, don't forget me. I, I'm like, I won't forget you, hon. Hi, guys. <laughs> Great to have her here today with us. Um, Mel, just Mel Hobbs, is on vacation. So my wife was able to come into the studio today. So, babe, again, thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us today. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. So, oh, my gosh. So, Ryan, um, I'm doing my best to remember who introduced us. I think it was Diane, yep. right? <clears throat> yep. Yeah, Diane. Friend of my mom's. Yeah. Oh, really? It's a yeah. friend of your mom's. Okay. <laughs> From years and years ago. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, she was actually on our show. Gosh, not too long after we started. I think within the first four months or five months. That's awesome. Yeah, she's had a heck of a story as well. But uh, I'm always blessed and grateful for people who keep their ears to the ground and um, I just got off the phone before the show of somebody else that, that we know who was also a guest on the show that knows someone that's gone through addiction and they're like hey you need to get a hold of this guy and we just got a phone we're gonna be scheduling him to come on and it's just yeah it's just awesome. great. awesome yeah so Ryan tell us a little bit more about yourself <sighs> well <clears throat> um, where do I begin at the beginning. At the beginning, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, you know, I, I was born at the, the University of Utah, you know, um, and, um, you know, we moved around a lot when I was young, uh, and we finally settled in West Valley. Okay. Um, my grandpa, Larry Higgins, he you know, was the patriarch of our family. He was the, always the, the one who we all looked to. Um, because he just was so steadfast in everything he did, and, and um, you know he got us a, um, a double wide trailer out in West Valley, and so when you go from apartment to apartment, school to school, finally when you settle and, and get a place that's solidified and you can put your roots in, so to speak, um, you know it was a different kind of feeling, and, and being a, a you know I think I was ten or no. I was eight. I was eight years old, nine years old, something like that. Um, but when you, you know, it was a nice feeling to have a school that I was going to be, you know, consistent with. Right. Mm -hmm. And people I can grow with. And, you know, I, I grew up in, in West Valley and I went to West Lake and I went to Hillsdale Elementary, West Lake Junior High. I went to Granger High School, um, you know, and I grew up, um, you know, playing football. And that's so when we when we moved out to West Valley, that's when I got introduced to football, and I got introduced to the culture of it. And you know, I grew up with a lot of Polynesians, and and you know, West Valley was just so different than anything I experienced because it's so multicultural. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's you know beautiful. You know, that was that was home. You know, and uh, and so. Just growing up and playing ball, and and I was actually pretty good at ball. I come to find out, and um, but a lot of the things I learned, you know, because my dad was absent because he was dealing with his own uh, addiction uh, and alcohol, hmm. you know, and, and my dad was a marine and you know served our country, and um, you know he was drafted by the Oakland A's. Oh my gosh! You know, and he, wow. he he made it to the the farm league, and he picked up his first check and never went back. Spent it all on booze. Holy you know, cow. so it, you know, addiction has been. Um, you know, there's a few people in my family that's been caught by that bug, and um, you know, but addiction with me hit me hard. You know, so I, I remember my ninth grade year at Westlake. Um, it was summer. I was getting ready to go into high school, and I was out with friends, and um, you know, we're sitting in his truck, and and they pull out a CD case and break up some white stuff on a CD case, and and uh, I said, "What's that?" You know, and he, he says, "Well, you don't need to do this. You're not, you know." And so, of course, 
the rebel in me is like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, now on. I'm going to do it, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I went from, you know, focused everything on, on sports, baseball, basketball, mainly football, um, to doing a line of meth at, at 15 years old, and my priorities changed. Oh, I bet. Yeah, they changed uh, immediately, too. It was um, staying up all night, running and gunning, and living that street life that comes with meth because you don't ever sleep, you don't think clearly, and everything's open, you know. Uh, so it was enticing for a 15-year-old kid to walk into that life, and I was hanging around people that were twice my age, and I got told continuously that I had an old soul and, you know, I carried myself, you know, not like a 15-year-old, yeah. which is weird looking back because I see 15-year-olds now and they, they look like 15-year-olds, mm -hmm. you know. There's yeah. not, you, you yeah. look at them and you're like, yeah, you're 15, yeah, no doubt. I, um, I think we look at ourselves differently because I've done the same thing. I've gone backwards and looked how I carried myself at, you know, 13 up until I was 17 years old, you know, and, and to me, I knew I was still a kid, but I still thought I was an adult right. at the same time, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's wild, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. we think we know everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do, <laughs> don't we? Yeah. I mean, we've lived everything there is to live in 15 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know it all. Yes, we do. <laughs> and, you know, and the thing I started doing um, is I started sneaking out, right? I started sneaking out the house and I would sneak out the window and and uh, you know you don't know it at the time you know because mom would come in and check on me and I'd be gone you know and you just you don't think about that how it affects your family right yeah, right. yeah. and I didn't think about it you know I just didn't want to get caught so I'd always sneak back in about four thirty, five 5 in the morning you know but you know her and my stepdad started catching on and they started they tried to screw my window shut and <laughs> and i would still figure ways out of the house and um you know i started getting locked up i started to you know experience that and it just became part of my routine you know it hmm. was you know i remember get, going in juvenile detention and i was so high on meth they didn't want to let me out of the cell my pupils were so big and I was so out of it. They were just like, well, we don't want to let you out of the cell. You got to, you got to eat and you got to calm down before we let you go in the section. Cause you're, you're just too out of it. You oh know? my gosh. Oh, you know, and I was, I try to be like, yeah, you're, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm fine. You know? And they're yeah, like, no, yeah. you are not. And, you know, I did this for a while and <clears throat> the only time that I was able to correct myself so to speak was during football football season i had all my boys you know and i have a i had a lot of good friends growing up you know the granger boys they were always you know they circle around you you know when you grew up when you grow up playing football you know it's it's family yeah you kind of have your pack right? yeah your posse yeah and granger was granger was different man it was you know we had the tack pack you know the the tough I don't know if I can say that word. Tough A kids, you know, tough. Yeah, yeah, you're you're fine. You can, yeah, you can say what you want. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. It, we were the tough ass kids, and it was T A K P A K, you know. And so my letters, letters, letterman's jacket, we have tack pack on it, you know. But growing up, that was our mindset because everybody was like, "Oh, you're from West Valley. You guys are ghetto. You guys are gang members. You guys are, you know, yeah. scum, basically." Yeah. And that's what I grew up with, like, and so. We weren't that. I mean, yeah, we we have family members, we're gang members, and you know we grow up to become gang members, and you know. But when we were growing up as kids, you know, we looked at each other like family, and when we balled, we played like family, and you know that was we were family. We go over and have luau's, and we go see each other's families, and and the one thing about the the Polynesian culture that I loved growing up is they were very family oriented. Oh yeah. Oh yes, yeah. yes. You know, and they they helped me become a better person as far as being, you know, a better man in the family, you know, and and so when I got on meth, I kind of veered off and and um you know, it just I couldn't stop, you know. I missed um my so my sophomore year, I was using meth. And I remember games where I couldn't catch anything, and I got really good hands, 
you know, and I, you know, I've always been able to catch anything in my direction. And I just remember games. We were playing Kearns one game. It was at Granger, and I could not catch to save my life. Hmm. Like the ball would hit me in the hands, and I would drop it. And my whole team was like, what's going on with you? You know, and yeah. I would play it off. And, and then – they noticed my behavior started changing because I started coming to school with different clothing and, and bandanas and, and, you know, the whole street thing. I have gloves in my pocket and, you know, <laughs> things that a sophomore in high school shouldn't be doing. And, you know, I remember one time Ray Groth, he was our football coach. He was the head coach at Granger. And I, I hear, you know, Ryan Evans go to Ray Groth's office. Ryan Evans go to Coach Ray Groth's uh, office. And I walk in, you know, thinking I'm just going to see my coach. And there's my Uncle Joel. <laughs> my, oh, Uncle G- my Uncle Joel's sitting on the couch. My Uncle Joel served in the Army, and he was a 20-year vet at the Salt Lake PD. And, you know, he's somebody I looked up to. I do look up to, and my dad's brother. And, um, you know, because he was there a lot of the time where my dad was missing. And uh, I get in there, and my uncle looks at me and sees the clothes I'm in and the beanie I'm wearing. And he says, take that beanie off and sit down on the couch. You know, and, and uh, you know, I, he kind of checked my attitude, and I went in and trained. And because Coach Groth, he's like, you know, Evans, you got a you got a lot of potential. You could go Division One. You can do a lot of good things, but you're in your own way. Yeah. You know, and so he reached out to my mm-hmm. uncle. He reached out to my family, and still I was still hard headed and still using. And I got locked up again, and I missed my junior year because I was down in the wilderness program. Mm-hmm. You know, and, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, I was there for a couple months, and um, I finally got out. And it was towards the end of the season, and uh, one of my best friends, Nate Peterson. Uh, you know, when I got back to school, the season had already started, and um, Granger, the old Granger, used to have the blue gym and red gym. I don't know about the new Granger. But you walk through the main gym and you go through the, you know, and you got to go to the back to get to those, you know, the blue gym. And and uh, it's right outside the weight room. And so I remember going and, you know, I'm fresh back. You know, I want to be, I want to ball because I love football. And, you know, Nate goes and opens. You can hear all the, the feet, you know, they're doing drills. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. doing drills, the whole football team. And Nate, you know, opens the door and he says, uh, he gets their attention. He goes, hey. Look who's back, right? And I come and I walk into the door, and everybody just started cheering and clapping and started, we're going to win. And, you know, and, <laughs> you know, it was good to have that. And, you know, my team, like, it, it's like family. And, you know, to have that, I'll always remember that. And I'll always remember, you know, Nate, you know, sticking by my side. And, and I mean, I had a lot of, a lot of good close friends and, and Rocky Hamilton and Pat DeFoya. I mean, we just, I mean, I can. It was just humbling, but it was really humbling that Nate Peterson, you know, he opened the door and got their attention and I got that reaction because I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. What position did you play? I played uh, wide receiver and corner. Nice. And so missing my junior year, I barely made my senior year because I f- football season's not there. I'm running and gunning. Yeah. And I got locked up again, and, and I barely made it out. I made it in time for summer school and um, barely made it by, like, a day. And I mm. barely made grades. Barely. I mean, I'm, I made the cutoff, and I'm, so I was able to play senior ball. And I still – and I relapsed during the season. But still, I was still um, first team all-region defense, second team all-state. Wow. And I just, you know, I if I would have applied myself, you know, I would have I know I would have played division one, if not more. It went much further. I, I know yeah. it, you know yeah. what I mean? But I don't sit here and gloat on it. I just I know I could have played division one. I know I could have done that. But I mean, I had different yeah. different things Dick. coming things that was more important so yeah let me ask you this you said that you started getting in trouble what was it that you were getting in trouble i mean meth <laughs> so it basically it wasn't like going out and starting fights or anything like that or just basically you were just on the streets and you were high and the cops would catch you and off or you had off something to jail. on you yeah yeah you or know did you still or anything like that to get you oh yeah away? That's oh what, yeah like, i think that's what that was yeah yeah just you know the steps that you get because i mean something's gotta 
land you in, in those cuffs, right? I mean, oh, yeah, it's not just that you're doing meth and no one's paying attention to you. You got to be right. drawing attention. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, like, you know, the part of the draw for me I learned later in life was the, yeah, the, the getting high was fun, right? Yeah. But what was even more fun and intriguing was the lifestyle, right? Yeah. Because you don't have rules. There's no rules. You're yeah. out there and you're around other people. Like there's there's a different set of rules, right? But they coincide with no rules, right? Yeah. As far yeah. as the law it is, uh, you know, as far as the law is concerned, you know. So yeah, we started out stealing bikes, you know, and then we stole. We started stealing, you know, stereo equipment. Then we started stealing cars. I started stealing mm. trucks and started. Oh, wow. You know, yeah, it was, you know, there was some crazy things you're learning as a 15 year old. I should never learn how to pop a neck on an old Chev or, and, and learn how to start it and, you know, loosen, you know, pop out the, the lock on the steering wheel. Yeah. You know, you should never know this stuff, right. but I, I knew it, you know, and I knew how to do all that. And so, yeah, it was, you know, things started piling up and, and then, uh, you know, the relapsing is what, um, you know, would, would keep me, you know, because once you start giving positives on, on UAs and, and you go in front of a judge who tells you, you know, if you come in front of me one more time for a dirty UA, yeah, I am <laughs> sending you to wilderness. And then I went in front of him. He said, Ryan, I told you what I was going to do. There's no secret here. You're going to wilderness. Oh, so he stood by his word. He stood by his word. He stood by his word. And. You know, and I, I remember a conversation that I had because I was listening to a lot of music that, you know, was, you know, you grow up in, in West Valley and you're listening to like Bro Brother Lynch and X-Rated and, and this kind of music <laughs> People is... People I've never heard of. Yeah, I've never yeah. heard of them either, yeah. <laughs> well, it's real, you know, it real, you listen to is the it lyrics. like rap kind of Yeah, stuff it's or? rap and it's, it's you know, you listen to it long enough, it starts to, you know, it, it adds to, uh, you know, the mindset for sure. Mm -hmm. Um but I remember one time mom came to see me in juvie and I was going to wilderness and she came in and, you know, I stood up and she, she was like, why do you keep doing this? And I stood up, I said, I'm hell bound, you know, cause that's one of the lyrics that's in the music, you yeah. know, I'm hell bound. And, and, you know, and she stands up and just whacks me and says, you know, sit down, you know, don't you ever say that again. Right. Wow. And it, and good it's what I needed. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. My mom's strong and she's very hard headed like I am. And she's very strong, you know, and, and I'm grateful for her. And I'm grateful for that moment because there's been a couple times, you know, there was a time when I was, you know, after senior year, um, when we lost in the playoffs. And, we, you know, when you play high school ball and you play with friends you grew up with your whole life, you get to that last game and the, that clock goes to zero, you know, it dawns on you that you're not going to play anymore with your brothers. You know, time that you, you know, since Little League, since eight years old, has now come to a stop, you know. Wow. And so, you know, it was hard for me, and I just left school, and, you know, it was beating me up. And this was the, the one time in my life where I was, you know, very weak. And I called, and I just told Ma, I was like, you know, I, I you know, went and got a pistol. And I said, you know, I love you, and if I don't ever see you again, you know, this, you know, that whole yeah. You know, but I don't think I was mad enough to do it, but it's still. And I remember her telling me, she says, Ryan, shut the F up. You know what I mean? Like, don't you talk like that. You're better than that. Don't you ever call me with this weak stuff, right? And it woke me up. I was like, man, you know, we hung up the phone. And it got me thinking, well, I ain't, you're right. I am not weak. What the heck, what the heck am I doing, you know? Yeah, why am I yeah. thinking this way? Yeah, why am I thinking this way? That's... <clears throat> You know, and other people would have been like, oh, you're okay. You know, what? you have somebody that cuts right through it. You know, like, no, shut up. We're not doing this. I'd like to pause you for a minute. Yeah. You said earlier in the show that, you know, when you, when you were sneaking out and doing all this stuff, not realizing what it was doing to your, to your yeah. family. Right. Yeah. Do you think as tough as your mom was with you that day, hanging up that phone, I, and and I may be wrong because I don't know your mom personally, but I would think, oh my gosh, she would hang up and go and, holy shit, yeah. I hope the hell I just rung his. I hope I got him thinking, and how paranoid she 
was or either could have been by going yeah this is this I might is not a, see him tomorrow. I might not yeah. see him tomorrow or ever no that's I'm glad you pointed that out and um, she she's told me multiple times she says you know <clears throat> every time I hear the sirens mm -hmm. every time I hear cops and every time the news comes on and they have a, a breaking story my heart drops oh, yeah. because I think it's gonna be you this time yeah. <laughs> You know, and when you have your mother telling you that, and I continue continually do the same things that were causing that, you know, it's she probably got to a point where she's like, you know what, if I don't do something now, I'm gonna lose him. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and and you know, thinking back on it, I just there's so so many things that I did growing up that you know I understand. Uh, when they say a fatherless home, you know, because my mom was only so strong in certain areas. Yeah. Yeah. There were other areas where she could have used some, some help. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, I understand that, that logic now. I understand the threat of the dad saying, hey, son, we're not doing this. Yeah. You know, and even still, there's some cases where that doesn't help anyway. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. with a the father there, there's that threat. You know? Yeah. you know, and I could imagine even what your mom was going through as well because she had to have lived through some pretty bad times with your dad with his alcoholism, right? Oh, now yeah. she has a son that has followed that same road. Yeah. I mean, she's probably going, Yeah. holy crap. And, and if, and I don't know if she's anything like my mom, but, you know, my mom <laughs> beats herself up about everything. I was crippled when I was a kid. And... I think some of it had to do with genetics, but my mom blamed herself for years that she yeah. was a bad mom, that she didn't have enough vitamins or nutrients when she was pregnant with. I mean, she just beat herself up over it, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know if your mom did that in silence, you know, but I just can't imagine having a husband and then turn around and, I mean, because you know how moms and sons are, right? They're, oh, it's yeah. usually yeah. it's a close, close bond, just kind of yeah. like dads and daughters. Right. So I just couldn't imagine what she was going through. And I'm sure at during your addiction, like with my wife, because I remember times when I kicked her out and then I would get that call which says unidentified number. Yeah. And, you know, I would just feel all the blood rush to my feet going, they found her dead or they found her raped or something. Right. You know? Yeah, that's... Uh that's the, <clears throat> it sucks anybody that goes through what, you know, any yeah. type of addiction, yeah. right? Being on the other yeah. side. Um, yeah, I, I raised my kids single. And um, I have a daughter that um, struggle. maybe I shouldn't say that, <laughs> As, that struggles with suicidal ideation. Right. And so there were so many mm -hmm. nights that I would get that call, you know, and saying that she's gonna kill herself and all that stuff. And that, I did the same thing as your mom, it's like, I wake up in the morning and I wonder if there's going to be a message on my phone, right. you know, and so I can empathize with her and it was just like, it's just like, you can barely sleep at night, you can barely think about anything else because you're worried, so worried about the kids, so yeah, and then I turn around and I do it to them again, I mean do it to them instead of, you know, because I got into my addiction after they were... Adults, Mostly basically. adults, yeah. yeah. So. Well, first of all, props to you for being a single mom. Thank you. That's that's legendary in my opinion. Um, any single parent, you know, raising a child is yeah. is paramount. And so, um, yeah, I've watched mom um, go through some things. And, and when it was just her and I, and she had a boyfriend that, you know, and I don't talk about this a lot, but I, I it, it's – you know something that needs to be addressed because I I went through it and I think it caused a lot of uh, anger in me and a lot of um, mistrust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and she had a boyfriend that you know I remember I was a little kid and he threw weights and hit me in the face and um, I remember I was bleeding and um, he started a bath for me right and um, so when the bath was full. He picked me up and threw me in there and it was scolding hot. Oh, jeez. So I jump out and he says, oh, sorry, was that too hot? Right? He goes, let me, run you another, let me run you another bath. And so he runs me another bath and he picks, it up, picks me up and throws me in and it's freezing cold. Right? 
Um, and so I, I think I developed some mistrust at that point in my life. Yeah. And another time I went to a neighbor's house and I, I think I was rebelling as a kid and I was, took all the food out of the fridge and I was throwing it everywhere. You know, that should be a clear sign of something's going the on anger, with this kid, yeah. you know. Yeah. But he, he took me to his gym and he made me run the treadmill and then do wall sits. And, it, and anytime my legs were hurting and shaking too much, I would try to stand up and he would squirt me in the face with Windex. Oh my God. Right? Holy crap. So, and these are things that I finally was able to tell my mom, you know, what we were going through at this age. And oh, by the way, when she knew something was off when I was little, so we packed up when he was gone one day and we're sitting out of the light trying to get away and we're turning left and we look over and he's turning left to come towards us and he starts chasing us and shooting at us. Oh my gosh. Right? Holy cow. Yeah. And so, I mean, we ended up on somebody's lawn, the cops got called and they basically told my mom, we can't do anything unless he kills you basically, you know? And yeah. so I just remember going through that, but I stuffed it, right? I stuffed it because I don't want people to use it against me. I stuffed it, and and I think a lot of that played in. And then my dad's alcoholism, you know, he'd be just the nicest person in the world. And then when he drinks, he became this mm -hmm. ruthless, yeah. like he was mean. It's like flipping the light switch oh, on, huh? Oh, man. He, yeah. And, yeah, and he was brutal. Like, he, you know, he would tell me, you know, I'm going to break your effing jaw, you know. And just, just, and I grew up thinking it was normal. Like, oh, it's just daddy's yeah, drunk. That's Nothing. the way it goes, yeah. You know, and... But that played into a lot of my anger because later in life when I started using meth, fighting became more prevalent and then, you know, it just be, became part of what you did. And um, you're getting those emotions out, right? Everything yeah. that you're holding in of what's been going on in your life. Like you said, you yeah. think it's normal. Yeah. So you're like, I got to release it somehow, right? So you mask it with the meth, right? right? And then you release it with your anger, basically. Yeah. Or your actions. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. And, he, and, and in the meth world, when I was growing up in the meth world, that was the added to you, right? Well, people yeah. don't mess with him because, you know, he's, he's you know, he'll, he'll flip on, he'll, yeah. he'll go. He's crazy. He'll do he'll it. He'll yeah. F you up. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? And that's so it became part yeah. of the, that's what the badge of honor you wear in there. And then, you know, and so I, I, I remember I was, you know, on, um, uh, APMP and which is mm -hmm. adult probation and parole and yes. and uh, I was we know that one <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah yes so I was on APMP and I remember me and my ex were fighting at the time and long story short I got caught with a, a 22 Ruger rifle right 18 years old I just I was about to turn 19 um, and you know my my PO kept asking me where I got it. I said I don't know you know and he was real upset that all I could say was I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I got I got sentenced to um, federal prison at the age of nineteen. Um, wow. So I went from from high school to federal prison, and I fished in um, out in California. You know, at Taft Taft FCI outside of Bakersfield, and what was it called? Taft. T A F T. Oh. Yes. Taft. You're there. You call it Tuft. <laughs> Taft wasn't didn't Dave go to Taft no I, I don't think I don't know if Dave did but it was the the lady that we had on that Brad brought on that was in prison oh that was Portia Portia yeah yeah Portia that's she right she went to Taft she went to Taft yeah mm -hmm. that's oh, wow. why that name sounded familiar to yeah. me yeah that's yeah. why I asked what one was in yeah. California yeah, so. that, yeah that was and it was weird it's like a different world yeah you know when you when you go there and um it was just weird, 19 years old, walking on a federal prison yard, you know, but it's all open. You go, you have, you know, you have um, the yard and you got movement and, and, you know, they tell you attention on the compound, 10 minute movement, 10 minute movement, right? And so you go where you go, you go to the library, you go to school, you go to the gym, you go to the yard, you go where you're supposed to, they're not, you know, it, it was just weird for me. and. Um, I finished up my time at Lompoc. They pronounce it Lompoc. But um, in California, you know, I went went down there because uh, I did the drug program. And um, Lompoc had palm trees on the yard. It was, it was wow. just a different yeah. place, you know. And sports for me has always been the great equalizer for me because inside the penitentiaries, 
sports are a big deal, right? You know, you either play sports, you're involved in sports, you bet on sports. A lot of things are sports related. Mm-hmm. And and so I I uh, that's what kept me sane. That's what kept kept me out of a lot of unnecessary drama. Um, you know, and, and it just it was it was crazy. Um, I remember at Taft, um, I went out and the A League is all blacks. But the B League is all, you know, whites, Mexicans, natives, everybody else. Okay. And so I went out and I was I picked up and I was playing around, you know, they because I got on the yard I wanted to play. Too many of the B League guys wanted me to play on there and they're like, We can't let you because it'll be unfair. So the only way you can play is if you play A League. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was the only white boy that played A League. Oh, so you were surrounded by all those yeah, I didn't, black I didn't, guys. I didn't grow up in in the politics. I didn't grow up in yeah. anything like that. I grew yeah. up around Polly's and around in and, West Valley. And, like and we balled. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it didn't was, matter. Right? It didn't yeah. matter. And so yeah. I never, I never, you know, subscribed to, you know, oh he's that color. You can't hang out with him. I don't care. The racism right? wasn't there. I no. mean, it didn't have anything to do with it. No, right. yeah. and so, but I, you know, I played, and I remember the first, this brother, man, he's playing wide receiver, and he gets out, and he looks over at the sideline, and he looks at me, and he starts laughing. Like he was going to ball me up, and I remember he didn't <laughs> catch not one pass, you know, not one pass on me. I played great defense, and, and the game got, was shortened because there was a fight that broke out, but – um but it was, you know, it was great experience to get out there and ball, you know what I mean? Because um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I have a perspective that most people are good, right? And there's, you know, there's a few people that in this world that have some evil tendencies yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, yeah. There's some darkness as far as their souls are, you know. But a lot of people, most people are good. And so... Yeah. It was a cool experience to go through that. I did referee, right? I was on. I, I refereed the A League in basketball, and I never did that again. Oh, I was gonna say I don't <laughs> know. If I would want to do I that. I almost job. started a rumble. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I was the only. You know. I would feel pretty threatened if I was refereeing. Yeah. 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 They were. Uh, they, you know. I just kept hearing, yeah. "Come on, white boy, make that call." And and you know, I. I you know that didn't bug me you know but i just i was trying to call the game fair but then i realized well i'm more of an athlete than a a referee or umpire or anything like that so i'm just gonna ball i don't don't need to do this stuff so (laughs) i I didn't do that again but um i I finished up my time in lompoc and 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 i remember when i went to the the doors and, and i was leaving um you know the the fellas walked me to the door and a lot of the Utah boys, you know, because in, in the feds, it's about your car, you know, the 801 car, you know, it's about where you're from. And, hmm. and uh, you know, Cali's so big, it's about what city you're from, you know. But yeah. um, I remember wa- them walking me to my door, and I felt sad when that door closed, even though I was going home. Wow. You know, I felt sad that I was leaving them all behind. And I feel like Portia said that in her book, too, that she felt sad about it. Yeah. Cause I think it's because she made spend, some good friends there too. Yeah. You spend you know, so yeah. long there, twenty four seven, and you get to this gets to be family. It's kind family, yeah. Family like thing to you. Oh, right? it for sure is because I mean, you, you, if you find people in struggle and you can relate, you know, it, it's it's a uh, it's a bonding, right? right? Yeah, and so I mean, if you look back, I'm sure there's people that went off to war that bonded that are lifelong friends. Yeah. People that went to the think, NFL, lifelong friends. I think I did that like in some of the rehabs I went yeah. to. Yeah. It's just I spent so much time with them and yeah. Really, you know, we got vulnerable with each yeah. other and that made is that me. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> That's you whistling. <laughs> and that made it so you know, I bonded with them. I was very close to them when I left, and I, I was actually kind of sad every time, every time I got close with people. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's just being around people for so long. Yeah. You just get that way, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, I definitely, I can, I understand that, you know, because once you go through some trials, tribulation, struggles, things that, and you, you get people around you that can relate, Mm-hmm. And you guys learn how to build each other back up through that. 
it's bonding. Uh, it's the best way to put it. But yeah. but I remember I left federal prison. I took the Greyhound. I went home, and, of course, Mom was at the bus station waiting for me. And I went to the federal halfway house. Um, and I was there, you know, a couple months. Um, and then I got out, and I was only, you know, I was only out for a couple months from the halfway house. And that's when I my life really changed. So up until this point, I've been doing, you know, what I was doing. I've been to prison. I, I you know, I've done some some stupid stuff in my life for sure. Um, but I, you know, there was um, a night that f- would forever change my life, and it was uh, the night of April 29th, two thousand five. Okay. And um, I remember I was. I had had some gang stuff go on and somebody had threw a rock through my window. And so we had, we had, you know, taped up the window and, you know, me and a couple of friends were trying to, you know, find them and, and do some get back, you know, how that goes in the street. And, and I remember I was in my room and, and, um, you know, my stepdad, Dan, Dan Vigil, you know, him and my mom were together for like 25 plus years. And, and he was, like a father figure but he you know wasn't really a father mm-hmm. but he was a father figure in some aspects of my life um you know and and he had came in my room and this guy's big this dude big mexican dude right he's six four and you know 220 230 and ex bodybuilder but he was just he's a healthy dude and he had a mullet you know to the day <laughs> he died he rocked a mean mullet and <laughs> and uh he comes in my room and he says, Ryan, please stay home tonight. And I had my girlfriend at the time on my bed and I felt like he was trying to put me down in front of my girlfriend. And, you know, I'm being like this young, yeah, yeah. you ain't going to tell don't me. Don't tell me. Yeah, yeah. don't tell yeah. me. I'll do what I want. But he's like, please just stay home. And as soon as he left, I, I told my girlfriend, let's go. You know, we left and we went across the street and down a little bit. There was a house where um, there was a meth house and that's where people went and smoked and and uh, a friend of mine Jared was there and he was going through some stuff and um, you know he was heated about somebody else and um, and I was sitting there with my girlfriend and, and uh, another friend of mine was there and they left and, and you know Jared and I ended up in the back room and um, a little argument ensued and more so on my end um, I could have easily um, handled this situation a lot better, yeah. uh, thinking in retrospect. But, you know, I ended up hitting Jared with open hand a couple times, and then I hit him with close fist. And um, I hit him three times, you know, here, here, and here. And, um, you know, he was knocked out. And I walked out of the room as he, you know, he had fell and, and so I walked down the room, I got halfway down the hallway and something told me something was wrong. And so I turn back and I go back in the room and Jared's still on the ground unconscious. And I noticed his lips were blue. It, w- it was like he wasn't breathing and, um, you know, I didn't know what to do. And then people started coming in the room. They're like, what'd you do? And what'd you do to him? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, uh, you know, everybody starts to panic and, and, um, and so to me, he wasn't breathing. So the owner of the house came in, was doing CPR, wasn't working. So I grabbed him. And years ago, my mom was, it was after football practice. We're at, um, the gas station across the street from Granger right there on the corner. Um, she was eating orange and she started choking on it. And so, she gets out of the car i get out there trying to you know she walked me through she grabbed my hands put it on her stomach and she makes the hitting you know to hit and i did it once and she's she's you know harder Mm -hmm. like go and so i did it and she popped out of orange you know and so mom's still here and if you're listening you're welcome you know (laughs) (laughs) but uh you know i just uh it just dawned on me you know like well, she wasn't breathing then, so I need to do that to Jared. Yeah. So I picked him up, and I, I do that. And I remember he, he spit out 
little pebbles of blood, um, but I remember the sound on the intake. It was just so distinct. I I, I can't even, you know, it's etched into my brain. I bet. You know, and I was like, we got to get him to the hospital. You know, let's, you know, so a couple of the guys carried him. I, I ran to the car, opened up the back door. They put him in the back seat, and I told the owner of the house, get in the back seat and keep him alive. You know, and I, I remember going down 3100 south um, towards Pioneer Valley, and um, we pull into the emergency, and, and I, I get out of the driver's seat, and I bang on, you know, the doors, and, and it's early morning. It was like 3 a.m., you know. And um, the nurses came out, and I remember I went, tried to grab Jared, you know, like, hey, uh, um, come, you know, pulling him out. And I just remember he was just out, and um, I just felt like, you know, I've gone too far this time. Yeah. Um, the nurses, you know, excuse me, sir, let's let us help him, please. And so I get out, got out of the way, and they they put him on a stretcher. They took him in, and. And uh, I just remember asking doctors and nurses and people, you know, is he dead? And is he dead? And because when you're on meth and you you think the worst, you 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 think of things that are so far off, you know. And so I was like, suicide rock. I'm you know, if he dies, I'm gonna die, type of things. And I've never been to suicide rock. I've never been one to think about suicide. I'm not that type of person. Like all the years I've done in the penitentiaries and all that stuff and all the addiction, all the mistakes, like there have been times where, you know, that one time I thought, but never seriously like put yeah, any effort in any. Yeah. Yeah. I think the world will have you think that that's an answer and it's just not the answer right. ever. And, you know, so, um, and I just, I'm at the hospital, and I just, you know, I tell one of my other friends that was there, uh, Rico. He he was he had followed me there, and and they're like, hey, the West Valley PD is coming to talk to you. Um, so just they want they don't want you to leave yet. So uh, they, you know, and I told Rico, I said, I don't know what to say, man. I'm I'm so out of it right now. I just I don't know what to say. And and so we go in there, and Rico just follow my lead, man. And 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 so we make up this story that we were coming home and we were crossing the street into Parkway Park and we heard something, a commotion. And um, so we intervened. And so instead of owning up to it, you know, we made up the story to where I was the one that, you know, Regal too, but yeah. we intervened and saved them. Yeah, saved the guy, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, they're like, did you get a good look at him? We're like, no, they're in dark clothes and they took off and you know, we brought Jared to the hospital, and so, so, I want to pause you right here <laughs> because I think this is a really good cliffhanger, right here. So we're going to pause if you're okay with yeah, it, absolutely. Ryan, to stop for a commercial break. Oh, perfect. Because, yeah, because yeah. I'm very <laughs> intrigued of, of what's going to happen next. Right. It's kind of like that look that people on soap operas give you, and all like right before the big final thing hits. Yeah. But yep, they advertise. Yeah, so if you're okay with it, yeah, yeah I'm good. Guys, please stay with us um, to hear what's going to happen because this is going to be incredible. So, anyway, stay with us. We'll be right back. Do you or a loved one or someone you know struggle with addiction? Have you lost hope or are you struggling to make connections? Have you been to other treatment programs and have yet to reach your full potential? We, we are Matter Behavioral Health. Health. At Matter Behavioral Health, we understand substance abuse treatment works best when the client is taught ways of identifying for themselves their own dysfunctional views of their life that trigger their self-limiting beliefs and leads back to addiction. We help you get to the core of what's causing your addiction. We offer inpatient and outpatient services. To find out what's best for you, call us at 435-462-2781. That's 435-462-2781. Don't wait. Give us a call. Your life depends on it. Call us at 435-462-2781. Have you ever been in a car accident? Do you know what to do after being in a car accident? Are the insurance companies going to take care of you? Hi, I'm attorney Rick Heaton with the law office of Bobby Udall. 
I will help you through the process and answer all of these questions. I give every single client my cell phone so they can talk to me whenever they need. Let me deal with the insurance company so you can focus on getting better from your injuries. Call me at 385-330-0226. Again, my cell phone number, 385-330-0226. Don't call the insurance company first. Call attorney Rick Heaton at 385-330-0226. Hello, my friends. This is Brad Newfeld, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Resilience Talk Network. You can listen to my show, Resilience, every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. On my show, we will be discussing what it takes for you to overcome the day-to-day -day challenges that all of us face in life, as well as some of the devastating ones that may lead us to feelings of hopelessness and despair. It's my goal to provide you with the tools and skills that you need to overcome anything that is thrown your way. To find out more about my show, visit our website at www.resiliencetalk.com. That's www.resiliencetalk.com. And as always, until we meet again, go for everything that you want in life and make it happen. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Other Side of Addiction. Today's topic again is prison, addiction, and redemption. We are here with our special guest, Ryan Evans. Okay, <laughs> when we left <laughs> right before the break, you was talking about April 29th of 2009. Five, 2005. 2005, my apologies. I wrote down, I must have heard the 29th and still thought 2009. Life really kind of started, I mean, it changed for you. You'd just been out of prison. Yeah. Okay, your your stepdad came in, asked you not to leave. You decided, hell, I'm leaving anyway. And you ended up getting an argument, and you hit this guy three times, yeah. rushed him to the emergency center. Cops are on their way over to talk with you. You and your buddy came up with this story that basically you're kind of... was untrue intervening and, and saving so yeah so let's yeah i want to hear the rest of this yeah and these so i've always grown i've my whole life i've been honest right i'm i'm an honest person um but this night you know i wasn't very honest at all you was probably and, scared shitless too right yeah yeah you know what but i mean even amongst fear you know we need to hold true to our values and you know being on meth it just you know takes that away takes it away and um you know it opens things to to allow you to do things that you normally probably wouldn't do um but everything mm -hmm. else it, it you know amplifies but you know <clears throat> so i remember the cop after we told our story of we you know intervened and and brought him to the hospital and I remember the cop asking me, well, he's missing a boot. Do you, is it in the car or? Said, nah, probably at the um, park, you know, where it happened. <laughs> you know, and the cop's like, all right. Took down our names, our address, all that good stuff. And and um, they gave me Jared's property, you know, because they had to life light him to the University of Utah. Oh, geez. They said, uh, uh, hey, Ryan, we're gonna life light him. We have his property. We make sure his family gets it. And I said, yeah, you know. So I call his family, and it's. I know that I knew they weren't going to answer. I left a voicemail, and I just said, hey, um, you know, Jared's being life lighted to the University of Utah. I have prop his property that I, I need to get to you. Um, you know, but I could have left on the message some honesty, and I didn't. And I remember, you know, leaving the hospital in West Valley, and. Um, I went straight to the University of Utah. I drove up there, and uh, he was on um, critical support. And, you know, um, I remember this guy came out, and he's like, hey, are you here for Jared? I said, yes, I am. 
he's like, well, I'm one of his teachers. I used to be a teacher when he was in, you know, elementary. And that's when Jared and I met. We met in fourth grade, Miss Bartholomew's class at Hillsdale. And hmm. um, I remember he had a broken arm and, you know, he was a, a little bit wild and, um, but he was my friend, you know, and so, um, you know, I go up there and, and him and I talk for a minute and I leave and I drive around for a little bit and I'm trying to get a hold of Rico and um, he wasn't answering, but I wasn't processing it like, oh, you're, you're up to something, right? I was too far in, into what I had just did. And um, well, and I went back up to the hospital and my girlfriend at the time came up and brought me clothes and <clears throat> I called my uncle because I didn't want to call mom. I already put mom through hell. Uh, and I just didn't want to break her heart again. So I called my uncle and, um, you know, and he was a, a police officer for 20 years and captain in the, in the army. So he's knowledgeable on some things. Yeah. And so I called him and I said, uncle, I need you to meet me at the hospital. And um, he said, okay. And, and we went in and I remember Jared's family was in the waiting room and um, they had heard the story that was given. And so when I got there, a couple of them, stood up and came and gave me a hug and said thank you um which you know that that part affected me more than probably anything and, and you know because i knew you know i knew his mom and i know i knew his little brother and and jared would spend the night at my house and, and him and i were in the dope game at 15 years old together you know we we hung out a lot and that was not the first time we got into it, but you know that was uh, my friend, and, and and so when his family came up and hugged me, man, that was total kick, you know, in places you don't want to be kicked, and, oh, yeah. and um, I should have owned up then, yeah, and, and took a, you know, least, I don't know, I just should have been honest, but um, long story short, they they interviewed me again and. I tell them the same story because when you're in the game and you go through things, it, it's uh, um, you stick to the story. You know, you hold your mud. That's what you're taught. You don't, you know, you don't break weak, so to speak. And, and so I just mm. stuck to the, you know, which I, when you do something like this and it, it involves a friend and, it, you know, like, like it's such turmoil inside, like, because you know, this is your friend and, and you know and then you have this you're supposed to be like you know but it, i had all this battle going on and and um i remember after the interview i asked him to let me go see jared again and i remember walking into the the room and his face his head has swelled up so much because one of the hits had caused a uh, lacerating of the artery and it oh, had caused geez. flooding to the brain um, which is why he was blue, which is why he was like that. I didn't know. I'm not a doctor. Um, you know, I've been in many fights. And, you know, I've always walked away from him. And, and, you know, so is the other person. And so I didn't think anything internal. You, yeah. you just don't think that way. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I remember I, I walked over to his bed and I kissed him on his forehead. And, you know, I told him real quietly, I said, please forgive me. And I'm sorry, and, yeah. and that I love them, and um, you know, and I walked out of that hospital, and I, I went back to West Valley, and and so the reason why my friend wasn't answering the phone was because he was at West Valley PD, and um, you know, and basically, you know, you know, he was there giving his statement his right? statement yeah and so when i thought he was going to school like he said he was actually going to west valley and uh and you know for a long time i kind of i held that on him you know i was kind of but then i i come to the the fact of jared was my friend and i was in the wrong so and so i remember going to the <clears throat> you know i i was outside um of the trailer where it happened i remember i walked in and I seen Jared Boot lying there on the ground. And I had the big South Pole coat, the puffy one. So I leaned down and picked it up because it's a dope house in my mind. And I put the boot in my coat because I just didn't want his stuff there. Right? Yeah. And I know how it looks from the outside looking in. Like I'm trying to hide evidence and all this. 
that was the farthest thing from my mind. It was I did not want Jared's stuff in this house. It's like you were protecting him in a yeah. way, right? Yeah. And and because this is a dope house. This is a house where anything goes and and I did not want his stuff in there. And um, so I had it on me and I remember smoking a bowl of meth and hanging out in the house for a minute and then I went outside and I was on the phone and I remember I walked to the driveway and I, out the peripheral I, I seen an unmarked undercover, you know, unmarked car and um, so I acted like I didn't see him I turned and as I turned and I seen another one on the top of the street and so I turned to walk back into the house and I didn't make it two steps and I was surrounded by cops and you know I had guns drawn on me and Jeez. and uh, Ryan Evans you you know you're, you're under arrest for the attempted murder of Jared Alcorn and um, you know that's and I remember the guy who arrested me was a a, um, a cop at Granger when I went there and um, the boot had fell out when I being put in cuffs and I just remember putting my head back like that didn't look good you know yeah. no matter what I say people will form their own opinions and that's Absolutely, fine yeah. but I know my truth and I know in a way I was trying to protect him after I just heard him you know what I mean but I didn't want his stuff there it just didn't look good but um, <clears throat> I went to West Valley PD and I, I you know they, they arrested everybody in the house there's people on parole, people are gonna get violated, this and that. And I said, no, I, um, I'll tell you what happened, but I want my uncle here. Um, and, you know, they tried to do the, well, just, yeah, we'll call your uncle and just tell us, I, you know, and I, I finally had to tell him, I said, look, I'm not telling you shit until my uncle's here. Yeah. And so my uncle came and um, they released everybody because I, I told him, I said, I'll, I'll let you know what, what happened. And so I confessed to it. And I was able to um, do that. My uncle tried to, you know, he's like, nephew, you, you know, you haven't slept in a few days. You're not thinking clearly. And I know he was trying to protect me. And I know he was, you know, doing that part. And he did. He told me multiple times. And I, and I just said, uncle, I need to do the right thing. I need to own up to what I've done. And he says, nephew, if, if you truly feel this way, I support you. I said, I do. I said, even if I don't ever get out again, even I said, I'm never, I actually said, I'm never going to get out again. And I said, but I need to do what's right. And so I opened up and I own, you know, and so they took me to Salt Lake County. And I remember usually going to Salt Lake County, you have a, a slew of charges, right? Or you have a few here, a few there, but usually me, I usually have a stack of charges. You've got the Christmas list. Yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this time I went in, I had one charge. And I looked down, and it's, you know, first degree uh, attempted aggravated murder wow. um, with injury. And as a 21-year-old oh, that's done time, has been in and out since 15, you know, when you're looking down at your charges that you're being charged with, and you see anything first degree with murder in it, it just it, it makes you look at things like, I remember looking at the news on TV. I just looked up, said, well, I'm never getting out again. I don't need to watch that, which I don't watch the news anyway because it's negative. But, yeah. you know, I – feel the same way. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I remember I'm in booking, and you can, you, you can make calls while you're in booking in the pits. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was on a phone call, and it was with a three-way, with another three-way, with another three-way. So I had a bunch of people on the call. They're like, why don't you call me? Why don't you just call me before you did this? And – and I remember, um, I remembered my ex came on the line and she says, honey, Ryan. I said, what? She says, they just pronounced him dead. Jeez. Oh, crap. Oh. Right? And, you know, there's there's not a lot that can to, that can accurately convey what I was feeling at that moment. Besides the word emptiness, yeah, right, because you you take a life, especially somebody you love, yeah, you know, yeah. No matter what you say, there's going to be people always that say you're a horrible human being, right? You know, and nothing you can say will change that, right? And there's some, there's other like my family that 
will stand by me, you know. But even then, later on in my addiction, they would get, it, it, you know, it would wear thin, yeah. right? And so my grandpa, God bless him, you know, got me an attorney and um, got me some good legal counsel. And even though I admitted to it, we took it to trial um, because they, 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 once I got booked in, they have that, you know, 72 hour window to file formal charges. Mm -hmm. And once they file those, that's what they're going for, forth with. Um, and they filed a manslaughter, oh, second geez. degree manslaughter. Gosh. That's really bad. Yeah. You know, and um, so they, they filed officially, I was, you know, going on with manslaughter and then obstruction of justice, another, a third degree, because I lied, which, that was facts. I did lie. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember going through that. I'm in Max in ADC, and mm -hmm. you know they let me out of Max after like two months, and I went down to Medium. I was in Medium for maybe three weeks, and I got in a fight and knocked two people out. And you know, I just I don't think I was ready to be around people, right? Because I was there three weeks. It was a good day. It was commissary day. We were all getting food. And something happened, and I took it upon myself, you know, to do what I did. And, um, yeah, by the time the men in black came, that's the, you know, <laughs> I was already at the door with my hands behind my back. Yeah. They're like, everybody rack in. He's like, what are you doing? Well, put him in cuffs. He's obviously did something, you know. And I was already at the door, and they took me back to Max, and I spent, I did the rest of my time in Max. And, and, um, <clears throat> You know, I just, I felt like that was probably the safest spot for me. Yeah. Maybe, you know, because what <laughs> I was going through and I just, I wasn't mentally prepared, right, to be around people at that time because I just, it's a lot, you know, when you, you're facing that much time and, and you're around people like, you know, you want to, you have to like, in a sense, ingrain yourself into that atmosphere, you know, and, and being involved with, with the gang stuff and, and you know like I you know I grew up around the Polly's and then when I went to prison I hung around the Polly's it's, you know I didn't change up like that's yeah. still family yeah they're yeah. still my family yeah. and um, you know and you know I get <clears throat> I go through this whole court proceeding and I remember when I went to trial and, and they uh, came back and they uh, they came back with their you know the jury and they found me guilty of homicide by assault, which is a third degree, and obstruction mm -hmm. of justice, third degree, um, which was better than zero to 20. Now I got a zero to 10 um, because the and definition. I just yeah. want to make it clear when you say third degree, you're meaning felony, right? Yeah. Okay. Just to make. Yeah, make third degree felony. Years. I knew what you were talking about, but okay. some might not. Yeah, and they, you know, and um, the definition of manslaughter is knowing or should have known you were going to cause death. And when you hit somebody with a closed fist three times and then you take them to the hospital, you don't really show that your your intention was death, right? And so and my intention was never death. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that ruling, and I knew I was going to do all of that time, you know, every day of it, at the very least seven years of it. You know, I knew yeah. I was going to do a chunk. Yeah. I knew I was gone for a while, and um, I just I just remember when the verdict came, and, and I just remember hearing because I didn't understand because there was so much, you know. Jared's family was on this side, my family's on this side. The court's packed, yeah, and the energy's palpable. I mean, it's just there's. I was nervous. I I just I wanted it done with because I was tired of having his family come to. You know, I didn't want to drag them through, and I didn't want to drag my family through. I just wanted to be done with this thing, man, and. You know, and I didn't even understand when they came back with the verdict. I had to look at my attorney, and I'm like, you know, because I heard my, you know, my mom. She said, "Oh, thank God," you know. And I turned to my attorney and said, "Well, what, what, what just happened?" He said, "We won. You know, we got it down from a second to a third. You know, and, and even when we, as we won, <clears throat> it still feels like a loss because, you know, you got Jared's family, mm -hmm. and I don't. So it still felt like I lost, you know, in a sense yeah. because." Yeah. I know they wanted me to do a long time and, and part of me is like okay well I'll do whatever time you feel you know but <clears throat> so I went off and I went through the you know the, the prison system I, I went out there and I ended up doing um, seven years in Draper 
and <clears throat> they gave me a parole after seven years. They gave me a chance because I did programming. I got a college degree. I got my high school diploma. Um, you know, I stayed out of trouble for the most part. And, um, you know, and um, the crazy thing is my dad had gotten out. My dad was out there too. My oh, dad, wow. My dad really? Was, yeah, my dad was out there for a manslaughter because he got in a fight and somebody died. And so, and then it, my case happened. And so, you know, he was out there, father like son, you know, I guess it, the old adage goes, you know, and him and I were able to, you know, um, cause I didn't want to talk to my dad over some stuff, you know, he, he was never there and then he tried to dab me, you know what I mean? I was like, nah, yeah, you too damn late now. Yeah. Right? You don't have that yeah. right. You know? And I was yeah. being hard headed and, and so long story short, I go out there and, and they get me into the drug program and that's where my dad is. Um, and as soon as I see him, I mean, because he got bit by a brown recluse oh, geez. out there, and they denied him medical for five days, and and um, he went unconscious, you know. And I remember when I was in Max in ADC, um, they had pulled me out because I'm next to Ken, and they said, you know, um, we need your permission to amputate your dad's arm, to save his life. I said, you need my they, permission. They waited to, that long, huh? You know, the oh, the prison man. did, yeah. Yeah. I, and I still had doctors out there when they see me. They're like, you know, he didn't get bit by a brown recluse. It was something. I'm like, nah, we're not even talking about it, you know. And, um, and so yeah, they they medically emergency medically discharged my dad, but we were able to reconcile his father and son. And he actually was there for me before he passed. He 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 made it three years, um, and he passed away at the end of '09. And I was going to the board for my initial board hearing. April of 2010 and you know my, one of the last phone calls we had with him I, I had my entire back tattooed and my dad you know I got a write up for it and he was just like son why are you getting tattoos you don't need that shit you know what I mean you just what are you doing you know yeah. what I mean like he was getting on me about it and um, you know and, and that was the last phone call that him and I had and then the next phone call came in it was from my mind they called me into the office and I get on the phone, my mom's in tears and she's like, your dad just passed away. And wow. yeah, after not having my dad to finally have him and then gone again and then gone, you know what I mean? That was, uh, yeah. I was mad, you know what I mean? And I was mad at God. I was mad at everything. And, but I, you know, yeah, it was, it was just a tough time and, I was surrounded by good people though in there and, and you know, my cellmate Bush, he, he was always there and, and my really good friend of mine, Chub Rock, he was there too. And, and you know, cause when you walk back in the section, I'm just trying to hide my face cause yeah. I don't want people to see me in tears, especially in prison. Yeah. But both Bush and Chubb seen something was off with me and, and uh, you know, they just, they were there to support me. And I just remember I was in the days you know, I was just out of it because I had just finally had my dad and then he was gone. Yeah. And so I um, had to work through some stuff with God and I spent a lot of time in prayer. And, and, and this is before I even knew scripture or knew anything like that. This was just me talking to him. Like, you know, and I remember swearing in the prayers too. Like, you know, I was just raw. And I was like, and I just, um, you know, I had to work through that, you know, and because you have to adapt you have to overcome you have to work through it and and uh you know i went to to lone peak from there and did a couple more years there and learned a lot of trades and and then i got out and when i came home it was we lived in west jordan now you know we had a house so grandpa had he had um bought my mom and our family a new house because he didn't want my little brother growing up in west valley because he would have had to make some choices yeah well you're the brother of ryan evans so you know you're either going to be this way or that way and and you know my little brother was incredibly mad at me for, for a lot of time because i wasn't there you know i remember i dropped him off in elementary and the next day i know when i got home he was on his way to college wow. you know i had missed all those that years time. you know and, and there's a lot of bitterness that you know i know he went through but he won't ever say it how far apart are you two? Ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, nine years and just about ten years. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, 
and I remember I slept on the couch for my first month, well, a couple weeks when I came home after seven years. And Ma had to come down. She's like, Ryan, you know you have your own room, right? You have your own room, your own closet, your own bed, your own everything. Why don't you sleep up there? I said, ah, I'm, I got to get acclimated. I'm, this is all, you know, because seven years being in one area, you know, and you get home and everything opens up. It's, you know, I developed this. Uh, I didn't like being around crowds. I didn't like yes. to be around people behind me. You get that fear. You know what I mean? I'm just, I was always on edge. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen so many movies and stuff where, you know, convicts get out of prison and they don't know what to do with life. Yeah. I mean, because when you're in a controlled so you're like environment. like relearning everything, huh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're in a controlled environment. You know the people you're around. Right. Yeah. Because this person knows that person and this person knows that person and, and this person's violent, that person's violent, this person's this, this person's that. So you have an idea who's around you. Mm -hmm. Right. But you come out here to the world and, you know, it's gone. Yeah. You can yeah. meet somebody you'll never see again, you know. Yeah. And so there's all these anxieties. It's too big. Yeah. It's massive. And so I had to go through that and <clears throat> I made it out 10 months and I started doing GHB. I started, you know, doing the capsules. And, and uh, I remember I crashed in the car, you know, because I, I G'd out, they call it, you know. And I, I was going back to work, and I fell asleep and went over all the lanes right there on, as you're going southbound. And there's mm. that 90th south exit where it gets congested sometimes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. We That's, know all about that. Yeah. We live off 90th <laughs> south. So. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I'm going there, and I remember passing out. I woke up going into the side of the wall. And I remember getting out, and I was so mad. Like, I kicked the door shut, and, you know, I remember seeing this cop, and it was traffic. I wasn't licensed, no insurance. Oh, shit. I had just crashed, and this cop acted like he didn't see me, you know? Oh, wow. He oh, says, how cool. Yeah, and I'm just, because I got out and just kicked the door. I was mad, and <clears throat> I was like, oh, crap, there's a cop. And then I noticed he was he was trying not to look at me. <laughs> I don't know if he had to get home or something, but. <clears throat> huh. That's cool. And yeah. you got blessed there. Big time. Sure. <laughs> And uh, but I ended up going back. I ended up uh, violating on that one, and um, hmm. I remember they they put me in the halfway house as Fortitude. They just it just is a new program. They called it the halfway back, and they're hmm. like, you know, here go here, and that's when I did bath salt for the first time because you oh, can geez. you know oh, you, can no. <laughs> you can pass UAs, and I, you know, here I am, and and I remember the the lady. The, the sergeant, she was like, they they had called me into the room and they had shut down the facility because I was just doing whatever I wanted. And um, they they put me in the room and she's like, you know what, Ryan? Like, you're not like some of these other guys. You're you're what we call high level. <laughs> like we're we're and she was trying to tell me I was being watched. You know? Yeah, yeah. And she's like, you're not. You know, I hope you understand that. You know, any little thing is going to send you back. And I didn't care. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't care. You know what I mean? Because, you know, when you're on gang file and you have a loss of life and you do a certain amount of time, you don't get out and just be like, oh, well, parole and do good. It's, well, we're going to watch you for a minute. Yeah. You know, and there's even a higher level of that, you know, and ISP and, you know, intensive supervision. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of levels and there's income. On, but anyway, so I didn't care. I was using it, and even though basalt made you kind of like dumb, like you can't formulate, like you'd right. have something to say right. and you couldn't formulate the sentence. But I remember going back and I was laughing. And I remember one of the ladies there, she's like, is he laughing? Hmm. And I said, yeah, I am. Because for the first time, I didn't catch any new cases. I'm coming home in two years. And she's like, oh my gosh, this is... What? It's like you got to be nuts. Huh? Yeah. Right? yeah. And I remember going back and uh, a buddy of mine, Timmy Vigil, was in, I was over in uh, you went, or, uh, A West and he was upstairs and I was talking to him and he's like, you want, you know, you want me to tell you the truth on how much you're going to do on this violation? Because I thought I was going to get right out. He goes, I said, yeah. He goes, you're going to do all two years. Oh my God. They're going to expirate you. I said, no, I didn't do anything. You know what I mean? I, I didn't do anything. Like I, I just I felt a, a UA. I didn't yeah. catch any new cases. <laughs> That's not and and so he was like, I promise you, just I just want to be real with you. You know? And then I got my date back 
and they expirated me. They gave me every day of my time. Wow. So they sent me down to Gunnison. I go down there, and that's Gunnison's where things started to slowly change, you know, in a sense. That's when I wrote down the words, So Elephant. That's my clothing company now, yeah. and that's, yeah. you know. And I remember I was down there in the Life of Program. I was in uh, C-section, and the C-section in their, their dorms, but in the bottom right, it's the cages, right? And I had my bunk right there. And... Um, so I started to, and you, I, I still have the journal to this day, and you can see the half and half. You can see the convict side of me, and then you can see the, the good side of me trying to come out, right? It was, you know, I, I have phrases in there like, they can't catch what they can't see, right? And then yeah. the next page would be, we'll lead by example, you know? And so you have these two different roads. And, and Yeah, it was, it was, you know, crazy. And then... I remember I was on the horse crew and and um, I wasn't really involved, so to speak, with the drug program that I was in because I didn't really care at that point in time. I was just over drug programs. And I remember when it came time for me to go home, um, you know, I, I had the F the police attitude, F the system, F for everybody. I just did this amount of time. You guys can kiss my, you know, oh, yeah. type of deal. I just yeah. came out with the wrong attitude and... And uh, I got out, and um, I ran into a friend, and uh, you know, handed me a whole bunch of dope. He says, "Here, welcome home," you know. And, and it was off to the races. I wasn't on parole. I wasn't mm -hmm. on anything for the first time in my life since I was 15. Jeez. And, but I wasn't ready, right? But I went through so much darkness during this time. I went through some incredible darkness, and. I actually met my uh, fiance now, who I'm with now, and who we just had a son with. You know, her and I just had our baby boy Liam, but I met her in the dope game at our dealer's house. Right, hmm. we met there, and it was just chaos. I went through like these psychosis. Um, I it was like 12, 13 months of just intensity. It hmm. was just evil, dark, intense. You know, I I don't want to go too far into it but that there were some things there were times where i just you know i remember having a um a conversation with my niece and she's like uncle rye you look sad and in my mind i thought i was angry and she was like no you're, you look, you look sad, sad huh? wow. and i went outside to talk you know she's like well i want to talk to you i said well i'm smoking a cigarette i'm going outside and she was 10 at the time but i was just like i'm going outside and she comes out and she's like well uncle rye what's wrong with you why are you sad? I said, I'm not sad, you know? And she goes, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, I'm not always going to be here, right? And yeah. she says, well, you know, as a 10-year-old, she says, well, where are you going to go? You well, know, she's curious. Once curious, like, yeah. where are you going? Yeah. And I said, you know, well, I didn't want to scare her, but I said, one of these days I just, I got to go see God and, and own up to what I've done. And she looks at me and she's like, Uncle Rye, God forgives you. No. Right? Yeah. And I and here I am, I'm not involved in any of that. And I'm like, Yeah, yeah, here you go. God forgives you, yada yada yada. You know, he loves us and all this crap, right? And I said, Okay, thanks. And she goes, Uncle Rye, he loves you. And I'm like, Okay. And she goes, And he's not ready for you to come home yet. <laughs> and I look at her and I'm like, What'd you just say? Like ten year old. I got goosebumps all yeah, over. Me too. You know, and, and yeah. I, I look at her, and I'm like, what do you mean he's not ready for, for me to come home yet? And she says, well, he has some things for you to do. And it hit me like wow. a ton of bricks, and I started to tear up. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm paranoid thinking she has something in her ear, like people are telling her what to say. And yeah. now I know it's angels that were talking to her to tell tell me some things, but... She looks over and she goes, did I make you cry, Uncle Ray? I said, no. She goes, yeah, I did. You know, but that conversation opened up some things in me to where I needed to, um, you know, I needed to, you know, open up to, right? And, I mean, I, I tell you, like, I was going through so much. I almost overdosed on bath salt and meth, you know, and I went to the hospital. Like, I ate a bunch of it and... I went through, I had the psychosis, everybody was trying to kill me, and so I was out in front of Vasa on Van Winkle, and 
And I remember I parked my Cadillac up by the street and I was just yelling at every person I seen driving by and I was just trying to fight people and I was just people, because in my mind they were they were coming to get me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, I because I opened up the bag of dope and I ate it a whole bunch and it was too much and then my my mindset and my energy and everything was just so intense that I was out there for two and a half, three hours that whole time. Just yelling at the world. Yes, and I, I, you know, and I had three different couples come up and ask me if I was okay, and I thought they were cops or fed, so I'm like, yeah, I'm good, I don't need your help, you know. And then on finally on the third couple, I finally was like, because my legs started shaking, and they're starting to give out, and, and uh, I finally said, yes, I need help, and my legs collapsed, and I went, you know, I woke up at St. Mark's, and but I didn't know it at the time, but I got there's video and where I'm sh shaking, you can see this energy going through me. You know, I'm like, ooh, like that. You can, you can wow. see this energy starting in my feet and going all the way through my body. And um, my mom came back from Vegas, and, and they, they tried everything. They said, all we can tell you is your son is either going to live or he's going to die. We can't do anything wow. else. That was your options. Just that was my two, options, right? yeah. Yeah, and there's, okay. you know, so a lot of the crazy stuff, and I could go on and on about that, those 12 to 13 months because there was a lot of intensity. Um, but I finally, I, I went back on a, a stolen vehicle, a robbery, because I, I stole a Mercedes, AMG, <laughs> you know, and because I wanted to get to Oregon. For some reason, I had it in my mind to go to Oregon. I don't know anybody there, but I got locked up and, um, you know, they globalized everything and because I had a bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, I pleaded to a, um, a second degree um, robbery, one to 15 years. I knew what they were doing. They wanted to have that over my head, and and uh, I took it. And um, you know, I remember going to court, and I remember APMP telling me, "You've been locked up most of your life, and you've never dealt with your trauma. We've got to get you into some programming because you know you've been locked up your whole life." Mm -hmm. So, so they recognize that. I think that's good that they that they at least recognize that part. Yeah, they did. But when I went to sentencing, yeah. APMP recommended prison. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, and, but I kind of felt like that was going to happen anyway. But maybe the lady that talked to me, maybe that's what she felt. But she yeah. was, you know, she was overruled by the, her superior. Who knows? But I'm glad she, I'm glad they violated me and, or they sent me to prison. And, uh, you know, and I just remember walking out of that, that courtroom. Um, and I felt something was different, right? And I remember... You know, going back to the section, and I remember telling, looking at my mom and my girlfriend, and telling them I love them. And I remember walking in, and everybody there got their programs and got early release. And I got in there, and I was like, "Well, I'm going to prison again," you know. And I was just used to it at that time. And I went to prison, and you go through you win a five, and you win a five's old death row. It's old school, has the bar still, and then you you know, it's just noisy. It's loud. They put TVs there too, so it's really noisy. And um, and then from U one to five, I went over to uh, Ochre two section two, and I was over there with a lot of the fellows. You know what I mean? And and you know I was giving my sweats and my shirts and my hygiene, and and um, I remember I walked right into a shot of meth. You know, come on in, let's do a shot. You know, and and uh, I just remember I stayed up all night that night you know, talking about sports and talking about all this stuff, but I just felt weird, you know? And the next morning I came out of the cell and I was just, you know, cleaning up the house. And um, I was like, man, I, I'm i done doing this. I am done doing this this crap. I am, I'm in prison because of this. And yet I'm here, I am doing it again. And I, you know, and, and I got asked, you wanna do another one? I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Well, here, sell it. Put, you know, I said, no, nah, I don't want nothing to do with it anymore. I'm done, um, and that's um, the last time I ever touched dope, and that was over six and a half years ago. And Good for you. It, yeah, yeah and that's, that's awesome. It was, it was cool, and it's been cool, and it's been a, a really good experience. And I was only in section two, over two section two a week, and then they shot me down to Beaver, and I was down in Beaver, and that's when I started to read scripture. Um, I met Mark Levitt down there, and Mark is, he's slung down, right? But he knows the gospel inside and out. 
and he's you know he just he's very knowledgeable and i i remember making a statement to him as i did to kj's dad you know i made a statement of when i read the scriptures i'll start front to back i'll read it the whole thing all the way through and kj's dad was like all right cool but when i said that to mark he was like yeah you should why don't you start right now I was like, all right, challenge accepted. What's up? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I started reading it, and I started going to church. I got my first blessing, and and then uh, I bared my testimony. I, I never been to fasting testimony. I didn't know what it was, but I saw mm-hmm. Mark get up there and bared his testimony. And then, you know, so I'm like, all right, well, since you did it, I'm going to go up there. What's up? I'm not going to leave you hanging. So I get up yeah. there, and I remember the, the Holy Spirit hit me. And I just remember looking out to everybody. I'm like, I'm not doing this for any of you. You know, I'm not here so you can run back and say, hey, look at Ryan Evans. You know, he's going to church, trying to change his way. I said, I'm doing this for me. Yeah. And I said, if God, if you could help me, I'm ready. Right? And so I just remember I had tears in my eyes, but I had my head back. You know, because I don't want to drop a tear. Yeah. I don't want to show what, that weakness in there in the prison. And uh, <clears throat> from that point on, I, I became coordinator. I stayed doing church things. I read the whole Old Testament. I read the New Testament. And then Mark asked me if I read the Book of Mormon. I was like, ah, I'll read, i got to read the New Testament again, and then I'll start that. He says, you can't read two books at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. So I started reading that, and I... To this day, I've read the Book of Mormon five times and, you know, the Te- New Testament a few times and Jesus the Christ by James E. Talmadge. And I started reading all these books about our Savior, right, because I, I wanted to know for me. Yeah. I didn't want your opinion or your belief or whatever you got to say. You wanted to come up with your own. Right. And so I, I started to, to learn how to fast, why we fast. I started to learn how to, to pray and I started to to read and educate my brain and, and you know I set all these goals in there and I remember I was teaching class and I'm in front of all these convicts right and I'm telling them look when I get out I'm gonna I'm gonna get baptized I'm gonna get my patriarchal blessing I'm gonna start my own clothing company I'm gonna get off parole I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to my daughter and open up that communication I'm gonna do all these things right and and I can just feel it from everybody in there. They're like, uh, yeah. yeah, you'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You'll be back. You've been in and out of the system since 15. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're not going anywhere. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and yeah. every time up until that time, I'd always be like, well, if I want to get high, I'm going to get high. I'm going to do what I do. Yeah. Right. This time I'm like, I'm going to change. I'm doing it. And I remember calling Ma the first time and saying, hey, I'm going to get baptized. And she's like, what? Christian or, or Baptist or yeah. something? And yeah. I was like, no, LDS. And she's like, what? You know what I mean? Because I was always the one that would, you know, say the LDS was a cult or Joseph Smith was a fake and da 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 But I was ignorant. I was uneducated. I didn't know what I was talking about. But, um, you know, and I told my brother, my little brother Sterling, he didn't believe. He's like, yeah, right. He's just saying <laughs> that, you know. Like, that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And my mom's really good friend, Mama Lynn. She told my mom, don't let him home. Don't let him home because when I was home last time, it was chaotic. Yeah. But anyway, so I get home and I go through the process and I remember uh, the missionaries came over there teaching me and I'm teaching them, you know, because I, (laughs) because I, yeah, 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 I'm like, okay, well, I see what you're saying there, but let's, let's look at it from this perspective, you know, and because I, I I relate to Alma the Younger and I, I relate to Paul, you know, and so I, I, I got baptized and, and, um, you know, I got my patriotical blessing. I started my clothing company, which is what I'm wearing. I wear it every day. I'm house director of four sober living homes, um, Phoenix Rising. Holy cow. So I I help people in addiction. We have 34 people in our program. Uh, Jeff Penrose is, is the owner of the program and he's, he's also helped me, you know, fill into that role. And, And so it's been a godsend and, and I opened up communication with my daughter, and it's, you know, she has a dad that raised her, but it's, we do converse, you know, and, and um, uh, KJ and I, you know, just welcomed Liam into this world. He's, you know, seven weeks old, and oh, he's, yeah. yeah, he's just a, a, a beautiful baby boy that I'm um, blessed with, and, you know, and now I get to come out and tell my story and hope that it makes a difference in somebody's life yeah. you know and God willing I'll keep doing it and you know because he knows not us yeah. yes we, yeah. For sure. we just have to trust that 
when when somebody calls you or hits you up on Facebook and says, hey, come do a podcast, and I said, okay, you know, we'll spread his word. And it's just been blessings upon blessings. And I just, I'm grateful to be where I am today. And I'm grateful for my Savior, Jesus Christ, and I will endure. And I will continue to send his message, and I will stand strong in the faith. And, you know, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, right? Yes. And so that's where our strength is, and that's where my strength is. So I'm thankful to be here. Thank you. I love Thank it. You. I love it. Well, let's yeah. let's stop for one last commercial break, and then we'll come come back and just wrap this thing up. During the break, I want you to think of just, yeah, I want you to talk about your clothing company because we always like our guests if they have something like a book or a clothing company or whatever. I'm we want to book. help you kind of promote that. Okay. But um, if there's some kind of advice that you can give to our listeners, yeah. so think of that during the commercial break that, uh, okay. because we can all learn from everyone, right. you know, so. Guys, stay with us. We're gonna be we're gonna be right back. I gotta keep my hands down because I got punished last time. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, this is Leticia with Computer Hospital. We are your computer repair experts for both PC and Mac. We are your community resource for all of your computer repair needs. What makes us different is that we want to fix your computer. We also do free diagnostics. We charge a flat rate labor, which means that you won't pay by the hour. All of our computer repair is done in-house with a fast turnaround time and same day service is also available. Feel free to stop by any time without an appointment. We're located in Sandy at 8721 South State Street. Again, that's 8721 South State Street. Or call us at 801-987-3993. Again, that's 801-987-3993. This is Leticia with Computer Hospital and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hello there, this is Brad Newfeld with the Resilience Talk Network, and I would like to introduce to you Taffy Town, one of our newest sponsors. Let me introduce you to Derek. Hi, I'm Derek from Taffy Town. We're proud sponsors of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Taffy Town is a family owned and operated business, still operating in the Salt Lake City area for over 100 years. We manufacture some of America's best saltwater taffy. What makes Taffy Town stand out from all of the others? We have a unique recipe, a whip style recipe that incorporates egg whites, evaporated milk, real sea salt. It's a unique product that is flavorful, melts in your mouth. And the best part is we probably have a flavor for anyone's um, liking, a flavor for any reason, for any season. Uh, we have unique flavors like chicken and waffles, maple bacon, frosted cupcake, uh, new this year was a pineapple ghost pepper flavor. That's awesome. Where can people find out more about Taffy Town and all of its products? You can check all of this stuff out. All of our products are available uh, for sale on taffytown.com. We ship for free from our website, so all of our pricing on there is, is shipping included. Uh, oftentimes we uh, offer special promotions and discounts to our loyal customers, so do be sure to sign up for an account and we look forward to seeing what we can do to make you smile with our taffy. Where are you located? We are currently located at 9813 South Prosperity Road in West Jordan, Utah, just at the foothills of the Copper Canyon Mine. Derek, taffy has always been a great gift to give. What are some of the creative ways Taffy Town can help say thank you to others? Yeah, if, if you're looking for gift ideas, whether to say thank you to friends or family, or maybe to your clients after such a difficult or successful year that you've had, you could look no further than to get a gift idea from taffytown.com. We offer prepackaged gift boxes that say that it's saltwater taffy from the city of the Great Salt Lake, and it tells a little bit about the history of our community and making candy for so long. You can also do customized gifts to pick out just the right flavors or colors of candy for that special someone and deliver even a personalized message in that box to them. 
So please feel free to check out taffytown.com for any gift ideas this season. Thank you so much, Derek. Please visit taffytown.com, that's taffytown.com, to find out more about the products and services that Taffy Town offers. You won't be disappointed. Do you know someone who's gambling with death due to an addiction? Do you know someone whose life is being turned upside down due to a loved one that's battling with addiction? Hi, I'm Al Richards. I am the host of the Other Side of Addiction podcast. I started the podcast due to my wife's battle with alcohol. Let's just say I became addicted to her addiction. Our podcast is helping people understand a little more about those who have battled addiction and those who are hurting from their addiction. Through raw vulnerability, we share stories that help uncover the root causes of addiction. Shame felt on both sides, matter of the conscious and subconscious mind, continued beliefs, and often confusing paths of recovery. We collaborate with real people and their stories, as well as licensed professionals to help our audience gain a better understanding of addiction. You can find us on Resilience Talk Network. You can also find us on Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. That's Facebook at Mr. Al Richards. You can also find us on YouTube. Just look up the Other Side of Addiction podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Other Side of Addiction. We are here with our special guest, Ryan Evans. And again, today's topic was prison addiction and redemption. And I tell you what, we got all three of those yes. in this in this episode. Um, Ryan, there, there was times that uh, you almost had me in tears me as too. well, which me I've too, cried yeah. quite a bit on our show, and I'm not ashamed to say it because... When those feelings hit you, they hit you, and, and yeah. they're there for a reason, and I'm not afraid of, of showing my feelings. And I think you and I kind of grow up in the same thing. And, and um, you know, if you're a guy and you cry, you're showing weakness, and it's not weakness at all. I mean, we got feelings, right? And well, in a, sometimes in we prison, need to get those like feelings out. Worse, right? Oh, I can imagine, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, don't I could only imagine. I don't know what they do to guys but, that um, cry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this journey, and, and I got to throw this in. Okay. Your ten-year-old niece basically yeah. was letting you know that God wasn't done with you. Yeah. Quite a few years went past that right before that light finally hit you. Yeah. Have you talked to your niece about saying what she said to? My you? gosh, you were right. Or I mean, where did this go any further with her? I don't think so with her. Okay. Um, I think it, it impacted me more. Um, her dad is a really, you know, she's not my biological niece, like okay. my kin, but her dad is uh, somebody who's um, been a lifelong friend. And, um, you know, I just, I think it impacted me more. But no, we haven't really, I mean, we've talked about it a couple times. Um, she blushes now that she's a little older and she's kind of like, oh, I made, you know. Yeah. But she, it's, I think she was just maybe too young to realize the impact. Um, I don't know. I. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm looking at it, and this is just how I'm seeing it, just by the way that you told this story. Cause, and, and I'm sure you may believe this as well, but, um, you know, God sends us other people. Yeah. you know to to help us with things and I think he shared a message through her that she didn't even probably realize that she was doing but yeah. when you hear it from a little girl that's 10 years old I would say yeah it really makes you think yeah yeah, yeah. and then you read scriptures to where you you find out in scriptures that God communicates through each one of us and especially through kids yeah yes you know he he uses us to help you know when we ask for help and then somebody comes yeah. into your life yeah 
you're like, no, I don't want you. I'm waiting for God. Well, God's sending that person. You know, yeah. you just never know, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and sure. one thing that I have learned from doing this show is people who have been through what you've been through and even stuff that my wife and I have been through, God uses both of you. Yeah. You know, um, my wife made a comment a long time ago once she realized why I was doing this podcast, you know, and it's like if it wasn't for my addiction, you wouldn't be doing any of this. <laughs> and she's 100% right. Yep. You know, in, in a way, a lot of the credit goes to her and God because, you know, I used to hit my knees and say, why are you putting us through this? Why is this happening? Right. Well, why is my why now? It's this yeah. is the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. And to hear everything that you've gone through. I mean, basically, you live the majority of your life in and out of the system. Big time. You're just now starting life, really, right? Yeah. yeah. You're just now starting life. You got a, a beautiful son now and, and, a, and a beautiful wife, and you're just now starting to live. And now you're getting that message out. So yeah. you went through everything you went through. And when your niece said, God ain't done with you yet, it's because you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're yeah. doing right now, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 That's how I'm seeing it. Anyway. That is how it is. I, I remember during that time, I looked up at God. I said, Why don't you just bring me home? Yeah. Let me face you and just get this over with. Yeah. You yeah. know, just bring me home. I'm done with this mortality. I'm done with this life. He's like, no, no, you're not. Yeah. No. <laughs> you're not done. You're no. You're just done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just be a little crybaby. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to help you out, son. Yeah. Just, you know, I got you. But, yeah. So as we wrap this thing up, is there something that you would like to share with our audience? Um, some either advice or maybe just how to look at life. And then also, you said something about you working with Phoenix. Is Phoenix it, Rising, yeah. Phoenix Rising. So if you'd share just those couple things here before. Awesome. We, yeah. Oh, and then also about So Elephant. Yes, definitely. Um, so with my recovery, right? Okay. Um, because I don't get here unless I recover, mm -hmm. right? And and um, I went through the Beaver. Um, it's called the Beaver Residential Treatment uh, Program. It's um, not centered around substance abuse per se. I mean, that's why you're there, but it's more about behavior modification. Um, because you know, yeah, the drug use is there, but it's it's your behaviors. Yeah that the drug, heighten it the drug is just the band-aid yeah. yeah and Being so i went the problem yeah and I, so i went through that program down there and i actually opened up you know i started to peel off the they say peeling the uh the layers of the onion back yeah they're like hey let's layer by layer let's let's get down to your why you know that's a big thing down there it's understanding your why why do you use mm -hmm. why it's, you know, you tell yourself it's fun or you like to be high, but that's not it. There's a why. Yep. You know what I mean? And growing up like I grew up um, with the physical abuse and all that stuff when I was real little to, to moving around and, you know, and, and through it all, I have a mom who is just tough with love, you know what I mean? But there was only so much she can do, yeah. you know? And then my dad, I had a lot of anger. So I had all these things. And then when I wasn't there for my daughter, you know, I was... And even when I was there, I was, you know, the worst thing that, you know, for a daughter to have, a dad on, dad on drugs and a dad that, you know, puts meth before a child. And, you know, and all these things happen when you're when I was 15, you know. And so, and then my grandma passed, my grandma Frances Lee Mae Curry, you know, and she was, you know, someone that I, I looked up to and she always took the time to, to teach me and, and to love me and, you know, and so my mom had, you know, good support. You know, she had my dad's side of the family, which my dad wasn't really there, but my grandma was. Yeah. My uncle was. And um, so I had a lot of these things I had to deal with, right? Um, and so I, I went through this this uh, this program, and, and I became a coordinator. And, and coordinator is you're responsible to run your section. So here I am running my section, and you know, making people like, hey, we're, 
you're in prison. You know, my one of my favorite things I used to tell people was, you know, when they complained, why don't we go to sit in class? Well, dude, you're sitting in prison. What else are you going to do? Yeah. Right? You don't want to learn? You don't want to learn something new? You know, that, 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 that says a lot to me. Like, if you're not in prison and if you're not educating your brain, if you're not reading and writing, if you're not trying to become better, then you're becoming worse. Mm -hmm. Right? And I know because I, I lived it. Yeah. And there was times where I didn't read a book. I was involved running around and, you know, doing all this stuff. And I wasn't getting better. You know, and I get out and I catch other cases. And, and I'm, you know, so you're either getting better or you're not. Yeah. It's simply put. And and so when I came home, I did all my treatment that I was supposed to with parole. And But when I became the director of Phoenix Rising, you know, now it's I'm in front of these guys every single day. And I'm telling these guys, hey, this is what our expectations are. You know, and the one thing that I tell them all the time is that I'm never going to come and tell you how to live your life if I'm not living mine right. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I won't do. Yeah. You know, and so I, it's been nice to have that development with these guys and to help these guys through their trials and tribulations. And some people just don't want change. Right. Right. Some people just don't care. Yeah. And that's fine. That's their lives. Um, but there's people looking for that hand there's people looking to help you open up that part of their mind you know read a book like it's cool you go to the gym seven hours a day but what about your brain mm -hmm. you know how about your spirit where are you at spiritually you know and, and you just I, i'm not going to be scared to say any of this to anybody you know because I'm, I'm about god right i'm about our savior and i believe in jesus christ I'm not going to hold up just because it might offend somebody. I'm sorry, but that's not who I am. Yeah. Right. You're right. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Like, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. Bye. Right? And so it's just been really nice to have this program and to see people make the change. And so I'm still in recovery. Right? I'm, I'm in still recovery there. recovery forever. Yes. Yep. It, yep. it doesn't change. Like, I will always be in recovery. Mm -hmm. Right? I think we can all be in recovery because... Again, it's wanting to get better yes. constantly. Yes. And there's other things that I've come to learn in my life. Uh, people battle with addictions of all kinds. Oh, yeah. Yes. You oh, know, yes. and so it's not just drugs. No. You know, and so it's, it's you, you've got to be the light mm -hmm. when everything else is dark, right? Because yeah. there's that old quote, you know, that light, sh light, light shines brightest at the darkest of nights, right? And so I, I just hold true to that, you know. So that, um, and then So Elephant, you know, yeah. SoElephant.com. You can check out our website, my website, our website. Uh, Mark's uh, the other part of So Elephant, Mark uh, Levitt, who I talked about in the story too. And um, we have a website out there. We have on Instagram, underscore So Elephant, Facebook, So Elephant. You can buy some some merch on, on So Elephant. Um, dot com and what kind of stuff is it? Uh, we have leggings, shirts, tank tops, hats, baby clothes. I got my son some gear. All right, yeah, that's cool. You know, but the thing I need to stress th the most about So Elephant, it's not just a catchy phrase. It's not just a cool hat or shirt. It's a lifestyle. It's a mindset. When you put it on, it represents you are representing your best self. So Elfin is about that. It's that statement of fact. It's, it's you know, I'm going to go out and do it big. So Elfin. You know, cool. I'm going to go out and achieve. I'm going to yeah. beat this addiction. You know, I'm going to succeed. You so, too. yeah. What does the back of it say? So Elfin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got the shirt. This is, I don't think it's it, but. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely see it. Yep. I love it. Yep. My gosh, Ryan, I mean, this has been really a kick ass interview i mean it Podcast. really really has yeah. i was just i really enjoyed it well, a lot of times i ask a few more questions but i was just so intrigued and just so wrapped up in what you were saying i just wanted to just keep hearing flow. yeah let yeah. it flow thank you so much for taking time out of your day to to spend it with all of us today here at the studio at resilience talk network just so grateful and um there's some people i want to get you in contact with because your story needs to be heard. And um, I know you said earlier that, that you 
love sharing your message and you know even we've even said on the show here many times if we can help save one person it's it's worth it you know the kingdom of heaven rejoices right yeah because that one person can save a person and it just keeps snowballing you know you never know who you're gonna help yeah so thank you so much for your time and and before you leave today yeah i definitely want to mention a few people that uh i want to get you in contact with so awesome anyway babe is there something you'd like to share before we before we sign i don't think so okay just really enjoyed it oh yeah absolutely guys oh my gosh yeah um, yeah you definitely got to watch this whole this whole thing because it is really kick butt we just want to say thank you to to all our supporters all our listeners all our many sponsors we've got so many people that uh we just want to say thank you to to and uh thank you to resilience talk network again with brad for opening up his arms and allowing us to do this in the studio our platinum sponsor matter behavioral so guys just thank you so much and again when you hear one of our shows all we ask is share it please with just one person share whatever episode you really get into just share it with one person and please ask them to subscribe because it really really helps us out and uh, just thank you to everyone for all your support we're gonna leave you with this as we do it at, at the end of every show remember addiction is giving up one thing for everything and recovery is giving up one thing for everything. We're out.